Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 36. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here, extracting the signal from the noise on a Friday when we do our recordings. I'm in Palo Alto, Dave's in the Boston office in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Dave, great to see you. Hey, John. Uh, great stuff. Just landed. <laughs> Just, Just landed. Just landed from Austin. Beautiful not really Austin, a red eye. Texas. A morning eye, not a red eye. Um, I got my Bruins shirt on again. I got a lot of great fan mail on the Bruins uh, shirt here. So go Boston Bruins. Um, big fan, as you know, even though I live in California, I love the sharks too, by the way. So, um, like the way where the Bruins thing, but a lot going on. Let's just get right to some main news. So, so let's get right to the, to the, to the big story in Silicon Valley, which is, and reverbing the crypto world is Sam Bankman Fried goes down in a, in a, in a hallmark, uh, landmark. Um, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say landmark fraud case. This guy is a total thief. It took literally record time, no deliberation, done, guilty, as charged, no defense. That's done in the books. Finally, that that and he got lucky too, by the way. The uh, the press didn't could have been more more on this, but with the Israeli war and all the other distractions, he got away easy by not being totally publicly fleeced on this thing because he's just a tool. Um he built everybody. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. We'll see what the sentence is. More regulation conversation. Biden put out an executive order around guidance around AI and, and it's scaring people. And a lot of people come out of the woodwork. Andrew Ning, who's the uh, founder of Coursera and part of Google DeepMind, basically said regulation is scary. People will get into that. Um, KubeCon is coming up next week, which is a big cloud native conference by the Cloud, um, cloud Native Foundation. Uh, Linux Foundation will be there. Supercomputing after that. Um, one of our cube analysts, Dustin Kirkland, got uh, a new job. Came out, went back into the to the startup world to be VP of engineering at ChainGuard. So shout out to our cube guest analyst. Apple earnings not as good as they hoped. Services carrying the day for Apple. And then finally, my rant is going to come up. Dave Solar Winds CISO gets sued by the SEC, um, and uh, that's going to be a huge discussion. Wow. It's putting shocks wow. throughout the security system why him why not the data engineering guy is the whole why is even a private company even responsible for what should be the responsibility of other people um people are freaking out um, more ai conversations you were at tech dell dell tech world we're going to unpack what's going on inside the ropes i know it's an nda but we dell can tech summit dell tech dell, summit yeah dell tech summit yeah, yeah i should say and then finally what i thought was the most coolest thing out there this week is the new beatles song Okay, John Lennon had recorded some stuff in the 70s and a software engineer had you know decoupled his voice from the piano on tape and it's just a remarkable story of archaeology around musical archaeology the creativity of the Beatles the shared fascination with technology obviously if Jobs were alive he'd be totally stoked because you know he loved the Beatles and, and it really marks the completion of the uh, the last recording that John Paul George and Ringo did together okay and with AI this kind of Re reboots one of the most popular influential bands in the history of music dave so this beatles song is pretty awesome and it's very cool so i give that the cool factor big time um but it's been a really interesting week i was also at palo alto jeremiah o yang and chris yay with blitzscale ventures a new firm they're putting together at a palo alto meetup with demos all the hottest ai startups called the llama lounge um and it was packed um, I was giving a little demo of our cube AI. Saw a lot of old timers and OGs coming together. The young young gun, guns are out. Dave, it reminds me of the early days of the web and web 2.0, but much faster um, incubating. So uh, just so much going on this week. The Hannah it's House, amazing. Right? Han Hannah House was it? Is that called? Han the Hana House, which Hana was House? the old uh, varsity <laughs> theater. That, and, and, and SAP was sponsored that back in the big data days. Remember, we did a gig yeah. there one year. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's a great it's, venue. It was, it was great. It was awesome. And you should have seen the excitement. I was uh, um, checking it out, the demos, and people were just showing their product. I brought my laptop because I thought it was like the old school meetups where people were just hanging out. No, it was it was rocking, high paced, much faster. And I was talking with uh, Ross Mayfield, founder of Social Text. He works at Zoom now. Uh, he's a Web 2.0 legend as well. And uh, he and some folks who from in the industry were talking about how slow it was in Web 2.0 compared to this. It was a slow, slower boil in terms of the innovation. Than it is now it's much faster so these meetups it's just dave it's just faster um and it's interesting i mean i mean you see it you were at the dell tech thing what, what was going on down there i mean because they just had a big announcement with, with meta and um yeah so they, they're putting in there I, I mean i'm really reticent to say anything because they must have said like 
a hundred times. Remember, this is this is NDA. And then I, it was funny. I said, you know, they, when you're asking questions, and of course, you know, we love to ask questions. So they say, state your name and your firm. So I said, this is Dave Vellante from the Cube Research, formerly Wikibon, and that is not NDA. And so, you know, that got a few chuckles. But um, it was really good. That's what I could tell you. There was a lot of analysts there. Um, it was in Austin. Uh, there was definitely executive presence. You know, no surprise, right? They, Dell always brings the execs to these things. Uh, and But this was a three-day deep dive. It's still going on. I had to leave early because I got a, a commitment at home tonight. So, I, I, you know, going from Austin to Boston, it's not easy to get back here. You either got to leave like, you know, 7 a.m. and get back at noon, or you got to leave later in the afternoon and get back at midnight like Stretche is doing. So Rob mm -hmm. holding down the fort, and they're doing right. deep dives. Like, like really, they went deep. They unveiled roadmaps. We debated. Uh, we aligned on a lot of stuff. Um, uh, there probably there were a lot of analysts there. I won't even say the number. And a lot of smart people. The thing about Dell is they have the end-to-end -end spectrum. So you get people that really know client and devices. Uh, guys like Bob O'Donnell, who's like, and he's he's more general than just devices. Like he knows, but he knows Apple really well. He knows client stuff really well. Um, all the way to guys like us, who you know, Stretch A, Data, myself, Enterprise, a bunch of Forrester and Gartner guys there. All the mm -hmm. IDC guys saw Matt Eastwood. It was it was a packed event, and um, really really good content. I, I again, I'm hesitant to say like exactly the format because there was they were really emphasizing the NDA, but. I came out impressed. It was one of the best analyst events I'd ever been to. Um, yeah. And they had customer input, partner input, awesome Gen AI conversation. They actually, they actually doing a lot more than people realize, I think. Um, well, I wasn't under NDA since I wasn't there. So I'll tell you what I think is happening. And uh, of course, I can connect the dots because I wasn't there, but I could figure out from what I saw was there and I figured and seeing what's going on the web, I saw some posts from uh, on the on the Llama news. It's clear that Dell sees AI is coming fast. And, and you know, Kelsey Hightower, um, who is a great Cube alumni legend in the cloud native world, wrote a post that said, if laptops keep getting faster, cloud-based developer tooling is going to become less appealing. These machines are so powerful that most the value add can run locally. Maybe we'll get a hybrid model SaaS running locally, but it's clear where things are heading. I had said, and then someone wrote, a MacBook Pro can do all those llama stuff. Okay, here in the pod, we said this. I also said it to Dell, um, uh, to, uh, is that they have an opportunity to bring a generation of new users that will use powerful laptops and servers to do all their local programming and then also train models and then put it in the cloud. So there's going to be a surge of on-premise. And if you look at Matt Baker, uh, his post on LinkedIn and talking about the Llama announcement with Meta and their commitment to that, you got to be thinking that they're on this because Dell, as you pointed out, successfully transitioned from the web. We debated this on the cube. I mean, oh, Dell went from you know when the web was mail order, they <laughs> when mail order to the web, they transitioned that. I think they're poised to transition. I think yeah, they were probably really low key because they don't want to telegraph their moves. But I can tell you right now, I bet Dell's doing that. So to me. You're seeing a lot more processing and compute. And remember how developers post, post it on the cloud, Dave, local host, code yeah, in the so machine, put it to the cloud. So I, I think you're going to see a renaissance in hardware like we've never seen before, especially as the silicon game gets better, especially as people want more uh, GPUs, as they want more TPUs and compute. Um, we had a quote on the queue, remember, at <laughs> SuperCloud. Um, Vikram said, compute should be oxygen. It should be free. It should be free. Yeah, but <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I could share this with you, which is not NDA, because I got this at the Dell Financial Analyst meeting. Sam Bird was there. He's the head of Dell's client division. And he talked a lot about uh, processor diversity, AKA not just, I mean, you're talking about uh, Intel, AMD, ARM, dot, dot, dot. And he also talked about NPUs inside the processor. And of course, Apple's been doing this for years. So they're kind of catching up to Apple on that front. Uh, but look at what Apple's done with the M series, right? I mean, and so, of course, the whole industry's going to follow. Apple's advantage is they design their own processors, right, with the, their ARM-based systems. Um, but so, yes, I, I think you're making some really good points there. And the whole Llama 2 thing is interesting, John. I have 
um, talk to other sources at Facebook, they don't really know uh, how what like what percentage of the downloads actually are running uh, Llama Two on prem. Like we use Llama Two, but we're using it in the cloud. Uh, but they don't really know. Well, I say we're using the cloud. It's actually sort of an alternative cloud. But so so they don't really know that you know what percent is on prem. But they can like look at who's downloading and say, wow, these are like financial services companies and insurance companies who have a lot of data, like sensitive data, healthcare companies on prem, and they got data centers. So they can infer that a large proportion of the downloads are actually being applied to models, oftentimes with, with, with retrieval augmented generation um, on prem. And so that's Dell's play, right? Dell, guys like Dell, HPE, Lenovo, IBM with Watson X, that, that's kind of hybrid AI. Yeah, it runs in the cloud, but it's also going to run on-prem. And, of course, the edge. So Dell is, I think, very well positioned there. Um, yeah. And I, you know, that's, again, that's not NDA. They've talked about that a lot at Dell Tech World and at the financial analyst meeting. Yeah, I mean, apps got to run somewhere, and they're going to run on computers. They're going to run on laptops. They're going to run on edge devices. And, you know, data, data and compute moving to the compute is going to be the, the compute engine. And this this retrieval rag you call it uh, retrieval automation generation that's a huge trend, mainly because it treats data differently, um, and for retrieval. And um, had a long chat last night with some uh, original you know web guys uh, uh, at this meetup, and we were talking about how um, the idea of keyword navigation in search like Google is going to make way for math uh, retrieval. If you look at rag, it's all math based and they do all kinds of these embeddings. It's a good way to get data and then get these similarities together and allows you to pull in things that are similar. But again, you got to have good data. And I think this data hygiene thing is going to be a huge part of that. So I think, you know, Dell's position and all these companies are positioned on prem because the cloud's going to be expensive. Yeah, and, 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 and it's going to be a huge cost. So well, at reInvent, it'll be very interesting in a couple of weeks. I'm going to ask Adam Selesky that question around cost. But, but Is so, that the blocker? So, yeah, but so just to stay on Llama 2 for a minute. So they, you know, they they announced Llama 2 in July, I think. And they announced a 7 billion parameter, 13 billion, and I want to say 70 billion parameter version. Now, just for comparison, Palm from Google is probably about 500 billion parameters. And I think OpenAI, you know, people speculate it could be a trillion. So the point is, models are shrinking and you can do a lot with smaller models, as we know with what we've done with Cube AI. Um, and these on-prem models in RAG, basically what they do is they take a highly uh, clean, cleansed corpus of data, like our Cube data, and they complement the LLM and they vector in that high fidelity data and then they send it back to the foundation model. So the results are much better, they're cleaner, there's less hallucination, they're more accurate. And then obviously you gotta train them, you gotta put in the right guardrails and governance, but that's the trend. I mean, it's relatively straightforward to do if you got a good engineering team. Yeah, I mean, AI, AI we talked about this last time, AI wrappers versus you know more, co-pilot, you know, native apps. We'll see what comes up at KubeCon. It'll be very interesting to see that. And if you look at the AI uh, earnings, you saw uh, earnings season's kind of in full swing. I don't know if you noticed, Dave, but uh, there's no sign of re-acceleration re in the software business, but you saw some winners uh, in like certain areas, like some cloud, the cloud players, Shopify was up, JFrog was up, Palantir was up, Fastly was up. But, you know, all the other software guys are down. Zoom Info, Paycom, Build.com, Confluent, Alassian, Pro core all the traditional software SaaS people getting killed microsoft uh, microsoft was the most notable to me of earnings because they're they really specifically i mean other than nvidia nobody's really come out and say we have an ai generative ai revenue microsoft said it, it it was a 300 basis point tailwind so three percentage point incremental tailwind to azure revenues so you know, you could do the math on that, you know, whatever. You Is that think. because they were well positioned with the products? I mean, and they had, was it because of their office suite and integration or was it open AI subscriptions? What do you think that was? I, I think all of the above. I think definitely open AI subscriptions, open AI usage, and, and they're, they're pushing pilot co-pilots at $30 per user per month to all their, you know, 365 mm -hmm. users, which is expensive as hell. But actually, have you, have you used that at, at all? Which have one? you played around with Microsoft's 
co-pilots on 365. No, I, I haven't used it, but I've seen it in action, and it's it's pretty friggin' impressive, John. I mean, the things you can do, and you know, drafting notes and setting up, doing doing things in Excel that used to be so complicated, and it's it's pretty powerful. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you're like thirty dollars per user per month. Wow, that's expensive, <laughs> but it's powerful. I I, I I what did actually, you use it for? What was your use case? So I didn't use it, but I, I somebody showed it to me. They were like, look at this. It was like watching VMware for the first time, you know, spin up virtual servers. I was like, holy shit. Um, I'm going to take they a were, look at it. Yeah, they were, uh, you know, basically writing documents. They were, they were doing spreadsheets. You know, sometimes, I mean, they have templates, but, you know, the templates never really look the way you want them to look. You're basically setting this up with natural language. It, it, it was very powerful. I want to. I think. I, I mean. I think. I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, we're doing tons of interviews leading up to reInvent, and we just had SuperCloud. So, to me, clearly, um, you know, I got a little essay. I'm doing a little, doing a little research brief, kind of a like quasi ebook on this day. But I'll tell you right now, and and, and even my daughters are in, who are in their, in the, just getting in their careers. There's conversations around: do we, do we limit AI? Right? Do we um, uh, engineer, uh, engineer it first, or we limit it first? And there's a lot of young people who are like thinking, hey, why don't we just, we got to regulate it. And they don't even know what they're doing, right? So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of approaches. And the key the key that's coming out of it is that the personal information space that you're mentioning with this co-pilot is really important. Help me do my job better. Help me do my documents or PowerPoints or set up meetings. AI-driven personal assistance is going to be a big deal. And that's going to be an instant low-hanging fruit. Those chatbots that were lame will become better. And then you mentioned the data retrieval and augmentation generation. That's where I see the business value, right? You start to see businesses. So you have the personal, you know, the four areas are personal and then business around this retrieval. People have all these data reserves. They have exhaust. Remember the term exhaust? And so you're going to see, you know, better retrieval methods, better use of data. That's like what people are working on now. And I think that's what you're talking about with Dell. And I think Dell's right on that. And then I think the third area that's coming out of this is where that what what happens next is once you start getting the value in the business side and that consumerizations happen, you start to get into new business lines or new data sets emerge. I saw one company I interviewed, they said they're in the aggregation business now. They're, they're actually aggregating data from other sources. They never could do that before. So you're seeing new competitive advantage features coming from their app or service around new new untapped potential around these data sets. And then finally, the fourth area of the AI is cognitive reasoning. That's where it starts to get kind of like squishy. So, and that's like like um, doing things like high stake drug discovery, um, doing mo molecule impact analysis, high end stuff that was unattainable that you could do with the AI. And I think those are the key areas that are coming out of all of our research uh, as the key uh, landscape uh, areas of use cases and, and, and opportunities. And I think the legal stuff, the regulation, jumps to the fourth one. It's we're not there yet. The reasoning and all that stuff—it's happening. It's that people are working on stuff, but we're so in the we're so in the early innings or not even game time around this because just now it's about personal, the co-pilot, help me do a better document, write a press release, help me write a story, do a PowerPoint. So I think. You know, let's get through one, two, and three, and then once the reasoning and the so-called, you know, <laughs> machines are taking over, that's down the road. So I am anti-regulation, and and people are like, "What do you mean you're anti-regulation? Don't you want guardrails? What guardrails for what?" Okay, this safety issues, I get that, but I think that's just you know uh, something that people just throwing out there to scare people. And I, and this is an issue. Andrew Ning, who's the founder of, of Coursera and DeepMind, wrote a tweet and said. He, he's not so much against regulation, it's about how people are freaking out and scaring young people and getting into the field, Dave. Well, like, like oh, that's interesting. So, you know, several things on that. So first of all, the the a couple of things that came out of SuperCloud 4, um, we're having SuperCloud 5 coming up soon in uh, end of November, but um, that whole idea of exhaust and model collapse when the LLMs are creating their own data um, and generating their own data then, and it's a probabilistic model, the, it increases the chance of over-rotating on the highly probable, and it misses the less likely. And you might think, well, that's no big deal. Why, why is that a problem? Well, in healthcare, that could be a huge problem. 
<laughs> if it misses the, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the outlier. Um, the other thing is on regulation. I think a lot of the big guys actually, they, they, they don't mind regulation because they know that's going to be a, a barrier for, for ent of, of entry because they can afford to, you know, work their way around it. Um, you know, the old term regulatory capture where, you know, the rich get richer um, with government. And the last thing, when we talked about this, I think last week on, you know, sentient AI, you know, art artificial general intelligence where the machines ha actually take on human consciousness. And I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it briefly, but somebody at, uh, it was the guy from Intel at SuperCloud yeah. 4 said, well, what if we're already there? Just a mind, a mind F, yeah. assume we're already there. Wouldn't the machines be smart enough to fake us out and hallucinate and make themselves look stupid and, and lull us into a, a state of relaxation? The, the only reason I bring that up again is not to repeat it, but you know, in talking to technologists, John, mm -hmm. all the building blocks are there to actually create artificial general intelligence. If you'd like draw the curves, you, you basically need more compute power and more data. And, and you know, people believe, and I'm kind of beginning to believe it too. I used to not worry about it, AGI, but I start to worry about it now that all the foundational elements are there, but you need more compute and you need more data, which we know we're going to get more data and more compute. At some point, quantum is yeah. going to be here and quantum just keeps getting better and better and better. So it's actually, and, and who knows yeah. how long it's going to take? We have no idea. Look at a, 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 a generative AI came out of nowhere. <laughs> right? yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, but I just saw the the founder of Signal. She's she's an, um, really technical. She's like, this is all bullshit. She was poo pooing generative AI. So in the tech circles, it's all like it's been around for a while. This is just a kind of new uh, window dressing around seeing something on the consumer side that's an interface that just Chat GPT. So there's not a lot of in the elite circles, like, come on, it's a yawner. Come on, let's get real. Now for main, us mere mortals or people in the mainstream, it's magical. So if you actually look at generative AI today, what is it actually doing? And I just laid out the four areas I think are the most important, your little buddy sidekick, you know, un 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 um, discover those data treasures, um, you know, that you have in your company, um, unearth the value, taking on big tasks, decoding business data, that's going to be value. And that's not threatening. There's no, there's no there there in terms of threat of, of AGI. Um, because no one's actually going to use generative AI to run things because of the hallucinations. And I think your power law that we're putting out there uh, that, that we built is on point because the power law that we are talking about this, the size of the models, we're going to see an alchemy of that models. And what's going to happen is no one's going to put up with hallucinations. OK, this is why the fear comes in. So the hallucinations has caused everyone to go, whoa, it's just not ready for prime time. Well, that's not true. What you're going to see is special specialized models. And this was, again, validated for multiple interviews this week I had with people that specialized models will emerge. I interviewed FactSet, big financial services company. Today. They have generative AI in production. And you know what they're using it for? To make their data sets freely available in Amazon's marketplace as data as a service because they have good data. So when you have good data, you can manage hallucinations. So that's going to be the engineering trick. So my prediction is AGI is fantasy. Okay, that is never going to be an issue, at least for a long, long time, oh, because uh, the reason, uh, the reasoning, the reasoning is not that good yet okay. to be that that okay. good. So okay. are people afraid that people are going to use AI to make decisions? That's a human decision. That's that's different. So it's it, are you are you guardrailing the tech? Where you guard really the expectations of the user who thinks it's real. That's going to be the big challenge. And everyone's going to focus on this problem. And, and it is about one simple thing. Is it real or is it not? That's going to be the question. And that's going to be the focus. And not, is AI going to hurt us? And who should, what's tech? Because a lot of these guys, the big guys want to stall and prevent the startups from getting in. That's a, a and that's what Andrew Ning was saying. It's like, it's a, it's, and we called it out in the cube, cube many pods ago. I said, it's all a scam, Dave, by the big guys to hold the market down. Okay. So, but so, um, <laughs> I'm kind of ranting or too early no, here, so, but no, it's good. Uh, my it's other, a, it's my other rant is going to be the CISO, but and we, uh, I mean, we did of, say that we did, we definitely said that at the time we thought Elon, in fact, you know, who started that letter was sort of trying to slow down the market. Cause he, he, he just announced this week, he's going to do something with XAI or whatever he's going to call it. But so, okay, so your friend from Signal, who's a super alpha geek, I have a really, I have a really great contact, a friend of mine who's deep. I don't necessarily agree with her. I don't necessarily agree with her, by the way. She went way over the top, okay, but, but she's kind of right. I heard her commentary. She was just poo-pooing it totally. It is, yeah. it is remarkable yeah. what 
ChatGPT can do. So I mean, I, regardless, yeah. so how come how come you didn't in, invent it? So anyway, but but nonetheless, she's super <laughs> we, smart. We kind of did. We kind of did, did with the Cube AI. But wait, wait, wait. So I have this contact. He's deep, deep, deep inside the government, um, and and he's not he's, he's not in in the government, but he's a you know, contractor. And I meet with him re pretty regularly. We talk, and he's like super into AI, has been for years. He's the one who told me about Eliza. Mm -hmm. If you look up Eliza on Wikipedia, it's like in the 1960s. It was like, he said, this is just a better Eliza. Back then, it was like a mainframe. It was probably an IBM mainframe, and it, people were interacting with it, and they were like, holy cow, this is like magical. And his thing is, and he really knows AI, but he's you know, biased, right, because he's got a perspective. He yeah. said that this is basically pattern matching in a database and some powerful search. It's not a learning system. Yeah. And that is what, you know, he sees as true AI. And that's why he's really down on full self-driving. He's like, full self-driving is like, you know, Elon says it's next year, next year, every year. It's, he's, he says, he uses a line to me. He says, there's a reason why we don't start driving, allowing people to drive until they're 16, because the cognitive yeah. development takes some time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so having said all that, when I, I was texting with him the other day, and it was somebody had made the statement like like you just said is don't worry about you know AGI yeah. it's not anything to fear and he's like oh yeah it is actually <laughs> and because <laughs> if and when it comes and it will come th there's a lot to fear and that's, so that's why John I'll just share with you that's why every time I talk to the AI I say please and thank you <laughs> just in case <laughs> well uh, well the the, the 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 over the top um, the brain uh, Andrew Ding was saying the first of all people are saying AI is going to cause our extinction that's like overblown. But I, here's my point to that. So, so I I think it's um, it's an evolutionary tech trend. So um, the reasoning is just not good enough. And I agree with your friend there. I think it's just it's going to get better. So here's an here's an example. I was talking about this last night with a bunch of um, old and young smart people uh, at the at the Palo Alto AI event at the Llama Lounge that Jeremy Oyang Jeremy Oyang put on with Chris Chrisier. And I said, back on the web in 1996. HTML was the format for web pages. Okay. Now go back, David, the time machine in your mind and think, okay, okay in 19, 1996, 1997, where were you? What would you have? You had a PC. We all had PCs. We had Windows. Um, and then how did you get to the internet? How did you, yeah. how did you actually get on? AOL. The, <laughs> you know, how, 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 what, what was the mechanism? Yeah, you had a modem, you had dial-up modem. modem. Yeah. yeah, what was the speed of the modem? It was like 96 19, baud. 2400 baud, yeah. 9600, 14, 4, um, K. <laughs> so people don't, young people don't remember this. They, they probably heard it. It's like, that, yeah. you know, the phone connecting. And it was like, yeah, yeah. it was so slow. I mean, it yeah. was like ridiculous. It was, it was K kilobytes, K, B, not we, M, B, or and G, we were G, like B. Loving it. Like, oh, they weren't giga millionaires. They weren't gazillionaires. Channel. Yeah. All right, right. So, okay. So we weren't gazillionaires like that AT&T commercial, which I love. So bandwidth was a dial up and web pages loaded slowly. And HTML was simply character based. There was not a lot of imagery because of the graphics were slow to load. So the question at that time, and I remember I was working with a, 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 on my first startup, which was keyword navigation. You type a keyword, go to a web page, which was a new concept. People were like, why would I type a keyword in when I could type a URL? Okay, that's now, uh, now standard. One of the side projects we were doing in parallel to besides keyword navigation, the name server was uh, HTML, reduced instruction set HTML. So in other words, making HTML load faster, Dave, on dial-up. And so you say, okay, that's a really good problem to solve because if you looked at it, Dave, and said, okay, at that time, the problem was the page loads slowly. So I'm going to ask you a question. You're the investor, Dave. You're the VC. i got a business proposition. I have technology that helps web pages load faster on modems. Do you invest or not? Is that a good problem? I don't want to put you on the horrible. Spot. I, you... I mean, it's a okay. horrible investment. I mean, looking back, because why? I'm just, because, I'm, I'm just trying to the think. Speed, the speeds, right. my point is the speeds get better. So that problem goes away because the next iteration of modem is faster. Then you get broadband. So what happens is the entrepreneurs went to solve bigger problems, not that immediate problem that goes away with the uh, evolution of the technology. So the bandwidth gets faster. There's more faster pipes. There's more data centers. So as people came onto the internet, it was faster to load. It was more graphics, full motion video. The processors got better on Intel machines. 
from 386 to 486 to Pentium. So my point is with AI, that's the same exact thing is going to happen. It's, it's nascent and early, and you're going to see the problems that people are bitching and moaning about are not the real problems. The real problems is scaling with the onboarding of AI. It's a whole nother mindset. So these young kids are like, oh, that's a good way to look at it. Well, don't solve the wrong problem. What will be solved by the evolution of the in, of the of the wave of the category? Is compute going to be faster? So yes. Yeah, G- definitely well, compute. You're going to have more bandwidth. You're going to have more GPUs. RAG's going to get better. The, more the data. Retrieval. You're also going to have just a, a compendium of alternative processing power in terms of CPU, GPU, NPU, uh, AI accelerators. I mean, all that is that the the combination, the combinatorial factors, this is something to think about. We've talked about this before, but I'll, I'll repeat it. The combination of those factors that I just mentioned are blowing away Moore's law. They're two and a half to, to three and a half times greater performance per annum improvement than Moore's law. Now, power per watt, you know, performance per watt becomes, you know, an issue, but that's why I love ARM. But, I mean, we're talking about processing power that's, you know, two and a half, three X that of Moore's Law's curve. So it's the curve's bending. Look at what happened with Moore's Law, right? Everybody used to talk about it all the time. Thomas Friedman, oh, Moore's Law, Moore's Law, Moore's Law, Moore's Law. Every time he came on TV, it's amazing. And it is it was amazing. <laughs> but this is like, order of magnitude, more amazing. Well, I'll tell you right now, the to me, the rise of the super cloud architect and operator that we're talking about is this foundational infrastructure. The middleware is going to be a big deal. Understanding AI architecture is going to be probably the biggest conversation. I interviewed a company this week. Um, they do data engineering, the, the fastest growing category in platform engineering, which is managing data pipelines. Okay. You did a story on Uber, right? This is the conversation again we had last night. Databases have to be integrated based upon what the use cases are. So you got time series, you got you got uh, SQL, you got unstructured, you got object store, open, open source solutions are surging. So you're going to have a, a road ahead that's going to look a lot like multi-cloud, multi-AI environment. So an AI system has to emerge, Dave. It has to emerge. So to me, it's very clear that there are things that will be get solved that will solve this fear that AI is going to take over the world and destroy society. So, you know, I'm bullish on AI for that reason, because the same thing happened with the web early on. It was very nascent. People poo-pooed it. Oh, the web's a toy for kids. It's not real. It's so slow. Look how elementary the graphics are. Um, And then what happened was the utility of it was so powerful, as you pointed out with, with chat GPT, it cannot be ignored. The consumerization of AI has made it a thing and expectation. And I believe every company, and Snowflake just announced something this week too. I'm looking at the, our, our feed here on Silicon Angle. They, they're now into AI. I mean, you know, a year and a half ago, like, ah, AI is not really important for us right now. They're now got it, right? So you, you, you're seeing that, Dave, big time. AI is everywhere. Why? Because everyone expects it. Call it AI washing. What do you want to call it? It's coming just like the web did. So it's, it's again, this, this whole argument, it's a no brainer. And I, and I get nervous that the fear mongering is going to come for it. Now, that being said, uh, I want to ask you a question because we always rant about the government. Who's faster, the government industry or entrepreneurs? Hmm. Let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, actually, I, I, I led the witness on that one. All right. So the government's not fast at all. So they shouldn't even be involved. Even industry itself. This is why I'm, I'm kind of like, watching these big so-called tech titans say, like Sam Altman, oh, yeah, we got to do this. I think he's full of shit. I think he's like totally blowing sunshine up everyone's, uh, you know what, and just trying to slow things down. So industry wants to stall. The entrepreneurial side of it's booming. So the question is, who should be responsible for the social aspect of how AI gets brought to the market? If you assume things are going to get better, um, like the bandwidth problem with the web. Um, I think the entrepreneur should drive this. I think let the chips fall where they may and have some sort of, you know, entrepreneurial code that says, hey, you know, do the right thing, which is don't go out of business, make some money, but don't do not do AI for bad, right? So this is going to be very interesting to watch. I mean, that's my take. What's your take? I mean, I don't think I have the answer, but I do know this, that the government is not is not going to be able to predict 
what's going to happen. And whatever regulations they try to put in place, I can almost guarantee there will be unintended consequences that will end up uh, favoring some, more likely the rich, i.e. the rich get richer. And generally speaking, uh, if not done properly, which oftentimes when it comes to big tech regulation, the government has failed miserably, in my opinion, it makes the U.S. less competitive. I think it did that when it broke up Ma Bell, um, the European uh, uh, mobile companies, technology, you know, companies, uh, uh, telecommunications companies dominated for the longest time. Um, Bell Labs is owned by Nokia, <laughs> as an example. <laughs> um, IBM yeah. became a yeah. shell of itself. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't think the government's track record has been good at all. Now, having, having said that, you definitely want the government to be in conversation with with industry and with entrepreneurs and to have a clue. They, but they, but they're, they have to be very careful, in my opinion, as to how they act. You know, the, 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 this is the other thing about democracies, uh, John, is that China can just say, you know, you can't do this. You know, boom. Uh, you, you know, Jack Ma, <laughs> you're, you're in the penalty box. No ant IPO. Done. Boom. By decree. You know, that couldn't have happened in the United States that quickly. So the question I have back to you is, is that an advantage for China that they can make, you know, proclamations and determinations like that? I, I don't no, know. China. Well, of course, it's an advantage when you have an entire government orchestrating together, colluding with it as one state is definitely an advantage. It's not it's called uh, it's called uh, communism, dictatorship. That's what they're doing. They're yeah, running but does everything. That, does that does that uh, accelerate innovation or does it potentially no, stifle they, innovation? They, they steal innovation. They don't do any innovation. They're stealing it all. That's what's proven. Look at the government should not be involved in anything. They're they're just they just sued SEC just sued the Solar Wind CISO, Chief Information Security well, Officer. Go rant. To, let's for, rant about that. You go okay. which, go do your rant because well, that we'll is come, unbelievable. Well, let's well, let's hold on. <laughs> okay, okay, let's rant on that now. We'll come back to the uh, the news on the AI regulations. But but the SEC is suing the uh, Solar Wind CISO for. Um, knowing that he could have stopped the fraud. That is unbelievable. It's unprecedented. And by the way, why the CISO? Why not the data engineers? Why not everybody? And by the way, it was a private company. They're not really the government. It's in the private sector. And so this is just creates massive problems. Um, it was no fraud. There was no other action. There was a hack. Maybe he didn't do the patch. He's got operational challenges. This opens a can of worms. And by the way, every company in security has to hire their own, quote, militia, to defend their companies from cyber warfare. We've been talking about this in the podcast. I've been ranting for everyone who knows me knows I've been ranting, howling at the moon for over a decade that every company has to defend themselves against foreign adversaries fighting a digital war, cyber war that our government is letting happen. And so what's even worse now is the government's flipping itself on its own people and companies. So, you know, you just, it just opens up way too much, um, problems in my mind because then why him why is he accountable why isn't this the, uh, the uh the the sres who's in charge of the infrastructure who's in charge of platform engineering um who's in charge of buying the endpoint protection what's device who does all the threat detection is it a data threat detection problem or is it the data protection why problem? not the ceo I hired mean, the ciso <laughs> I mean, it's just i mean it's just it's so stupid because the government's job is to protect uh companies that are in the sovereignty of the united states of america so it's like ridiculous. And so it's just, it's just, it's so counterintuitive. It's just, I'm so like weirded out by this because it makes no sense to me. If there's some smoking gun in there, you know, maybe that he was complicit in it. Maybe, I don't know, but based on what I know and can see from our reporting, he was just the CISO. He didn't patch it. Okay. He missed the patch. All right. <laughs> he, he ignored the flaw. What, what does that mean? <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, think well, about he it. misled he misled the public. Are you kidding me? The companies go out of business when they get hacked. He misled the public. It's not his job to be a public relations. Okay. His job's to protect. You know, and by the way, why would you share more information to the outside world when you're gonna know you're gonna get screwed by the hackers? Okay. They they they, they allege that he concealed security fee failures that led to nearly two-year-long attack called Sunburst. Okay. 
It was carried out by Russian hackers, inserted malicious code into SolarWinds network management software used by thousands of customers, including the U.S. government agencies and private companies. The SolarWinds hack was one of the most sophisticated hacks. It was the, 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 the supply chain hack heard around the world that, look, think about what CISOs and SecOps teams have to deal with. This is a, this is a good rant, John, because the, the partnership between government, private, private industry and government is broken in so many ways. And the, when, you, when you challenge government on that, you get a bunch of lip service. But just, you got just got to look at the actions of, of government. And I'm not saying they should give free passes on this, but, but wow, that, that was so, a shock. So that, well, first of all, so I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote um, some of the, some of the text here from our story, from our Silicon Angle reporting from the time of the initial public offering in October, 2018 until January, 2021, solar winds and Brown. Okay. Timothy Brown. Def quote, defrauded solar winds, investors and customers through misstatements, omissions and schemes that concealed both the company's poor cybersecurity practices and its heightened and increasing cybersecurity risks, the lawsuit says. It goes on to say SolarWinds public statements about its cybersecurity practices and risks painted a starkly different picture from the internal discussions and assessments about the company's cybersecurity policy violations, vulnerability, and cyber attack. Okay, they're under attack, okay? He's freaking out, you know, loose lips sink ships. He probably didn't want to say anything. Again, public company. Time of kind of war, wartime. You need a wartime conciliary when you have these kinds of situations. Okay, this brings up a good point, Dave. When I was at the Mandian conference and you were at CrowdStrike, one of the things that came up was, was AI could be used for all this compliance stuff. Now think about the compliance a CISO has to go through. Imagine getting attacked and you got to go in and report like file paperwork to someone imagine that your house is getting attacked and you aren't defending yourself but yet you got to get on the phone and deal with some agency bullshit it's like you, you got to uh, take care of what's happening yeah. your house is on fire bombs you don't want to be dropping right? bombs are dropping cyber warfare and so what mandy and, and and i were talking about was and this came up big time you can actually automate a lot of the compliance so I think this is where I was getting at the, some of the AI things in, in my in my um, essay. This is where you know the hidden treasures of data. You have the policies, you have the, all this stuff. You just automate the reporting. And this was a human problem. He didn't report it. Okay, it's a public company. Maybe the investors should know they're under attack. Uh, okay, well, what do you do? I mean, this is where the security industry is really challenged because they're already having a hard time defending themselves on threats and protecting their data, right? Well, There's plenty of companies doing, trying to do it, and they're constantly fighting an uphill battle like, like you've been reporting, you know, from the events. Yeah. Uh, the, the bad guys are winning. And this puts another, another, another rock on their shoulders to carry uh, in a war they're already losing. This is a great uh, topic. I mean, the, the SuperCloud 3 covered Gen AI and, and security. We have a, on December 12th, we have basically a, a Super Studio event with, with Dell support where we're looking at the, uh, what used to be an adjacency between data protection, mm -hmm. like backup and recovery and cybersecurity. Those, those two worlds are colliding. Um, we've got some great guests to talk about this stuff. To your point about automation and AI, one of the areas where LLMs and and, and generative AI can be super helpful is like just simple, like reporting to your point, automating run books. People hate writing. Remember like after a Zoom meeting, people would type up the, the notes. This is what we talked about. Now you just push a button, boom, <laughs> and there you go. Yeah, yeah. And, and by, by the way, Microsoft's got actually some pretty good capabilities there as well that I saw. But so, you know, those oh, are Zoom, some- By the way, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom has a highlight feature of your meetings. If you hit press a button and you're on the paid version, it gives you the highlights. Yeah, highlights, it summarizes the meeting. And I, I actually, from what I saw on, on Teams, and I'm not a fan of Teams, we, I, I trashed Chime the other day, but I, I used, I had a meeting. I used Chime the other day. It actually was better than I thought it. They must have made some improvements. I, I used to hate Chime, but it was actually really good. It was much more intuitive. Yeah, you're back and, on the Chime bandwagon. Nice. I wouldn't say I'm on the, I mean, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> you, you get used to one, right? But I'm not, I'm on the bandwagon. I mean, I, I didn't say I love it, but I wasn't hating it. It's much better than I, than I remember. And then in teams, I don't like, it's just non-intuitive to me, but the summary of the meeting was kick ass. But, um, 
Well, that's a good rant, John. It's pretty scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's we're gonna, we're gonna put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to this. It's gonna be an ongoing thing. Again, that that whole security thing is brings up this back to AI. We got we got there from the AI regulation. So let me just give you the rundown. I want to get your reaction to this. So here's the current AI regulation news for the week. It has it arrives. Biden signs an executive order directing AI companies to develop safer AI, which I have no problem with. In fact, one of our Cube alumni, Reggie. Um, uh, Townsend, Reggie Townsend SAS. from SAS was uh, in the White House. So shout out to Reggie Thompson at SAS and the SAS team. Um, I just impressed with the people over there at SAS. It's Reggie Townsend, quality. right? Yeah, uh, Reggie Townsend. Yeah, awesome guy. And he was featured on, on SuperCloud. Um, he's on the ethics side of AI. He's got a very interesting perspective. Great video. Search Reggie Townsend the Cube and watch that video if you're interested. He's really got a good voice on this. We're going to do more with him. Um, David Strom on our team put up a great analysis on, on on this executive order. It's promising, he writes, but it's going to be tough for the U.S. to govern AI effectively. And there's a lot more detail um, that is he links to an Ernst & Young report. I think it's toothless in my opinion, but that's I don't want to put a, a wet blanket on all the good work that the people in, in the industry are doing. So I kind of support it. It's an executive order. Okay, just leave it there, whatever, okay? Um, the Office of Management and Budget put some meat on the bone as well. They released a draft of AI guidance for federal agencies. That's out. So we'll see what that looks like. And then in the EU, a parallel effort that actually started earlier, Dave, 28 countries signed Letchley Declaration of AI Safety. Okay, so this is kind of a whole nother, you know, ball game, you know, uh, around the European side, the US, the UK, China, and 25 other countries signed a declaration stressing the need to address the potential risk posed by artificial intelligence. It's announced during a high pile summit summit in in in, uh, 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 in Europe in the European Union. So that's interesting there. Um, and then finally, um, it's just we had the AI event last night with the startup. So you know, as far as the startups are concerned, it's it's more productivity stuff, Dave. To your point, I would say that I watched all the startups. There's like a dozen startups presenting. A lot of them were like about productivity. Not a lot of game changing stuff. So um, maybe I just had a bad view on it, but I thought it was great from that standpoint. Um, the, the thing that jumped out was the Google Brain founder, Andrew Ning, who said the threat of AI is overblown, the threat of AI of human stinks overblown, and also went on to, to say that. I love the Kelsey Hightower comment around the, the, uh, the AI being used on local machines uh, as well. So that's, that's kind of the highlight of the news. What else is happening here? Um, oh, oh, Google. Cloud Vertex Search adds new enterprise-ready features. Snowflake added a slew of announcements. Um, LinkedIn's well, the, got an AI the, coach, chatbot coach, to getting a new job. The, the <laughs> earnings runs rundown is amazing. AMD was uh, initially looked like they were losing ground, and then they came back. Lisa Su was amazing. Samsung says its chip business is going to recover. Jay, Jay Shri Ulal's got Arista Networks, stocks popping, Commvault. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sanjay Merchandani is doing a great job down there. Qualcomm, you know, had their uh, their their thing, the Snapdragon Summit. You know, that's kind mm -hmm. of interesting. Rapid, J Frog, Rapid Seven got hit negatively. J Frog beat Confluent, got hammered. Extreme Networks uh, beat. Rapid but Seven, the stock Rapid was Seven, off. Rapid Seven beat. Didn't they? Yeah, they so no, yeah, beat. no, it hammered up. Sorry, yeah, Rapid yeah. Seven but did really, yeah. really well. Uh, Extreme Network, um, Extreme Networks was the one that was saying that they beat, but um, but they got hammered. Palantir um, is kicking ass. I thought Apple's earnings were actually better than I thought they were going to be. They had, you know, massive well uh, services. So services. The, the revenue they had revenue decline. And I know, but tightened. the services to me sets them up for the yes. future. I love that. I agree. Business yeah, model. Oh my I, god. I yeah, uh, exactly. You know, serv Fortinet is the it, that, that's a story of the first disappointment is rarely the last. Yeah. Um, you know. Informatica, you know, saying things are good, but they got a they did a layoff. Um, yeah. Western Digital splitting in two. Yeah, Broadcom still expects there's a VMware acquisition. Um, that Western Digital story was very yeah. interesting to me. That Western Digital Western story. Western Dig very, splitting into two companies, uh, right? Let's. That was talk very. About that? In, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I just caught it, but you know, they got an activist investor in there, Dave, and we remember they were a customer of ours, um, and we haven't heard from them in a while. So it's funny when the cube customers go dark, and something's wrong. So we should that should be like a bellwether in our little cube it's, index it's, stock, it's, stock follow, following. It's Elliott right? Management, right? The same company <laughs> yeah. that basically took down EMC and enabled Michael Dell. To, think about. Man. I got to go to the quick aside.
Can you imagine if, if – there's no way that, that Dell could have bought EMC in this interest rate environment. Never could have happened. I mean, talk about, yeah. like, having the balls to, react, to act when interest rates were low, which that's kind of my rant is, you know, Druckenmiller ranting on uh, the Fed, but we can come back to that. But, yeah, Western Digital splitting up, splitting the hard drive business from the flash business. Now, one would think it would make total sense to have those two businesses together – but Elliot thinks they can maximize the value to shareholders if they split them up. Kind of interesting. I, I, I think you know, that's a good point about the, the zero interest rate uh, thing. Uh, because if you think about it, that's almost like very junk bonds, like 80s, what they did, what they're doing, right? So it's interesting how uh, they could never pull that off here. But I mean, I, again, if you, look at, if you look at the earnings, Dave, look, look at the list there. It goes on and on. Well, by the way, we'll come back to that Western Digital. Yeah, it's and the, Splunk. There's a, there's, a huge private, there's a huge private equity gutting going on i don't know if you noticed but yes the bond the bond market the interest rates that are due i saw a um, a bunch of graphs this week on twitter uh from trent uh, griffin who's been tracking a lot of the bond maturity dates coming it's going to be a bloodbath and and people don't think this recovery is going to come out soon if you look at the stocks that we just talked about the ones that are hurting are those software companies and the ones that are winning are the picks and shovels for this next generation. So again, if you squint through the, the landscape here, you're seeing the rise of the cloud collision that we're going to cover in SuperCloud 5, which is battle for AI supremacies on, on point. The web was a shift. AI is a shift. Every, and, the, and the stakes are high, Dave. This is a massive wealth creating opportunity. This is a massive entrepreneurial opportunity. And I'm telling you right now, this is the beginning of a reset. OK, this is going to be the great reset uh, of, of this generation. You're going to see the winners and losers start to form and you're starting to see it right now. The so old software companies will die. Shopify is doing great. You know why? Because everyone's using Shopify. Their headless system is booming. Yeah. Um, and so you're seeing the picks Shopify and shovels. Awesome. Amazon, a Amazon doing well. Broadcom. I think the Broadcom um, is going to take a little bit of punishment. Maybe they take the medicine, but they're taking a massive combination with VMware, I think they're going to come out of that stronger. Uh, Apple, of course, they got services going to float the boat there. That could even go to a zero margin revenue model of services can continue the marketplace there. So I mean, I'm not saying zero, but like if services continue to grow, that's going to offset their hardware margins. Obviously, services are high gross profit, as you know. Splunk is an acquisition with Cisco. I mean, all the signs are there, Dave, right? Look at the winners. Storage, chips, uh, observability, uh, software development, tooling, well, uh, platforms, um, anything that's got a platform that enables um, value and sets up automation with AI is going to rise. Well, it's interesting. Uh, it's both, both Dell and HPE. I was physically at the Dell financial analyst meeting. I, w I watched the HPE one remotely. Didn't get the invite to the in-person or I would have gone, but Matt Eastwood went. I was talking to him about it a little bit. Both companies are projecting stronger momentum in compute than they are in storage. And it used to be storage was the much better business. And I guess it still is from a gross margin standpoint uh, in a profitability. Uh, but compute with AI is now the bell of the ball, you know. But you, you, you were mentioning the, the interest rates and the bonds. So this week, is, it's, it's not really a rant, but it's semi-rant. Stan Druckenmiller, like, ripped uh, Janet Yellen and the Fed you know, basically saying, look, they had this opportunity. Um, and he said, basically, Druckenmiller said, it started with Trump and Mnuchin. They basically, you know, I think ran a, I think he said a trillion dollar uh, budget deficit. So they cut taxes. Uh, economy was good. They could have, you know, paid down some of the, the debt, but they chose not to. So that ran up to debt. And then you get the COVID hit. So, of course, they had to spend money. And then the Biden administration came in spent more money. His point was that there were several periods of time when the, the Fed could have issued lo you know, longer-term debt, 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100-year debt. Uh, I, uh, I can't say, but I asked somebody mm. who, would, who had an opinion on this, who was in yeah. the know, do um, you think there would be demand for a 100-year bond? And the answer was, and this person would know, yeah. absolutely. Governments used to want to, you know, rest and vest, just park it. And so oh. uh, and so the whole the point is that that we missed this opportunity. So, OK, so now what do we do? And this is this is kind of my rant. And Druckenmiller was so right on that you absolutely have no choice but to attack entitlements. 
nothing else matters. You know, it's defense, Social Security, and Medicare are the big three. You know, how much can you cut defense? You have to have strong nation, but you can cut some. But Social Security and Medicare absolutely have to be cut. You got baby boomers coming in now. It becomes insolvent in nine years, and it's going to be just a massive portion of the the federal, you know, budget, you know, by 2030. And no, nobody's willing to talk about it. Not Democrats, not Republicans, no senators, no congressmen. Nobody wants to talk about taking entitlements away. Instead, they're doing cost of living increases. It's madness. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. It's, it, I'll tell you right now, the, the counter that cyclical uh, cycle around what's going to emerge in the, on the debt for bonds and interest rates, lo- loans and, 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 and bonds are coming due big time that's financing all this stuff. On the startup side, Q3 was a terrible um, numbers for startup valuations and round size. And so um, valuations and cash was, was bad. Down rounds were dominantly 20%. Uh, uh, down rounds remained prominent 20% of all rounds in the quarter. Nine straight months of high down round frequency, which means a reduction in valuation. Worst quarter on record, okay, on, on startups in the card to database, which manages like over a thousand rounds. Um, and then median C rounds are down significantly. So here's the data, Dave. So if you look at the seed round, the, what they call price seeds, that's kind of the new series A. It's back to 2004, five levels, Dave. You're looking at 50%, 50 percentile of all cash raised this past quarter for startups. It was... Um, 50 percentile amount of cash raised five the 3.4 million so 50 percent of the of the 500 to a thousand companies raised at the 50 percentile 3.4 million in the pre-seed on the 70 percentile 75th percentile it's 5.0 valuations at the 50 percentile was 13 million 70 percent was 20 million pre-money that's kind of like what it was Back in the day, classic VC, almost a full reset. Again, price C was the old Series A. Series A is the new B. So Series A funding, uh, 50 50 percentile cash raise was 10 million day. That's it, 10 million. High end was 17 million. So uh, it's, it's, and the valuation were 39 and 60 million respectively. We're seeing a very, very bad funding cycle for startups. Yeah. Okay. It's really... The worst I've seen. I mean, when you go back and take it to 2004, the last time I did a financing, I did a five on five on eight. Okay. Um, or at that time, I could have well, probably got 10, but a, you know, a, a five on eight post. No, that's post money was like um, 17 million. Okay. Five on eight pre. Well, yeah. no, no, no. I think it was a three on five. It was, it was roughly 33%. Oh, but, but it's, it's in these numbers, basically. I think it was, it might've been like 10, 13. I, I got to look at the numbers, but I can't remember, but this is old school, old school VC. So it's be very interesting to see how the angel market reacts to this, given that the AI startups don't match up. That's why the scuttlebutt in the Valley is go small, small ball. Yeah. But and, I mean, and, but companies uh, made money back. VCs made money back then. It just got so stupid. Course. Right. And then the other, the other thing that you mentioned, you sort of referenced is PEs, uh, uh, private equity firms. You know, as you know, VCs want to make, you know, 100x, 1,000x, 10,000x. I mean, absurd, right? Um, the, the private equity companies, I mean, if they're getting 2x with late stage investments, they're, they're kicking ass because they're putting in so much dough. Um, but, you know, if you put in money, you know, late in 2021, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're, you're seeing valuations get cut in half. It's that sort of UI path syndrome. Remember UI path at one point had, I think a 30 yeah. plus billion dollar valuation. People were putting money into the series, whatever it was, series F. And you know, now it's worth like 10 billion. So, you know, they're feeling the pain. Snowflake investors who came in late, like the Warren Buffetts, you know, they got in prior to the IPO. The IPO went out at 120 stocks trading. And I don't know, somewhere in the one forties, one fifties, you know, it's hovering around there, bouncing around. So they're, they're still making money. But who knows? That could change too. I mean, you know, that's yeah. a that's a stock that's still priced for perfect perfect execution because of the Sloopman Scarpelli factor. Um, who knows about Databricks? You know, Databricks supposedly had this, you know, nice up round. But who knows if they're even marking to market? Who you know? It's hard to tell. All these all these 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 private funds that are in there, they're. They're they're marked at basically either par with what what the investors put in. I mean, I look at my investments and they're all like, oh yeah, this we get this much value and it's it's only down like half a half of one percent. Okay, or it's basically flat. 
or it's up a little, or it's down a little. But if they mark that to market, it'd be down by half. But they get paid yeah. on the, the current mark, <laughs> you know, which is not well, to market. Yeah, I mean, the, the economy is going to be a very, very rough ride. I'm very interested to see how these next earnings seasons and what comes out of reInvent, Dave. So let's just go quickly wrap up what we're doing on um, KubeCon, Supercomputing, SuperCloud 5. We got really, I'm going to be essentially on the road this entire month. I think I'm home one week. Me too. Um, I'm going to uh, Miami five, next five, week. Five, five days this month, I'll be in Palo Alto. I'll be in uh, Chicago for KubeCon, CNCF, Linux Foundation. That's going to be always great. We've been to every every single KubeCon, every I'm, single one I'm since doing, the beginning. I'm doing, yeah, that's awesome. And DockerCon, I'm doing two events next week. One in Miami, the Cisco Partner event, and they're having a, a, a partner, I mean, an analyst summit as well. I'm going to see uh, Zias will be down there. Uh, Carolina Melanzzi said she's going to be down there. Uh, and then I'm going to IBM. Uh, Bob O'Donnell's going to be at Cisco. I'm going to see him at IBM. He's coming in a little later. I'm going to go in early for dinner because I haven't been to IBM's analyst thing in a while. So I lost touch with them. So, And I'm excited yeah. about IBM, John. I, the data shows Watson X. is. I think they finally got their shit together on Watson after years of, <laughs> of pain. Um, so I'm kind of excited for that. And then, yeah. um, you know, reInvent's going to be big with SuperCloud 5. Well, we got uh, supercomputing. That's in Denver, supercomputing, where all the chip action is happening. That's the same week as Microsoft Ignite, which will have team coverage from remotely. Cube Studio. So um, that's the same week as supercomputing. And then which, we're HPE Discover, know. which is the same week as reInvent. So we basically have SuperCloud 5. We'll be pumping in contact, content from Barcelona. We're taking our, you know, our, our previous re, uh, uh, Microsoft Ignite coverage, and we'll be pumping in our editorial content from reInvent. We got live studio in Palo Alto, SuperCloud yeah. Five people coming in. We just, I don't know if we put it out yet, but we're doing a call for guests. I know yeah. we've already we, got we some got, guests got, lined up. We, we got a lot of questions on this, so I just want a quick clarification, a little PSA. So we, the Cube will be at reInvent, okay, capturing editorial content. We have no sponsorship on locations. All our team's investment to go on site with the press area, getting all the top executives, getting exclusive with Adam Selesky. We're going to have all great content, no paid sponsorship work on site, all editorial, our investment. We're going to put money out of our own pocket to be there. At the same time, we're having an in-studio program. Savannah Peterson, Lisa Martin will be hosting in Palo Alto a live stage performance for two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. Chuck Alley and the team will be putting that together. We're going to be broadcasting more content in Palo Alto. And with thanks to our great network of SuperCloud supporters, that's happening. And what's going to happen is you're going to see a ton of content. So if you want to come into the studio or be part of the program, we have a request for speakers, request for panels. We want to bring your own panel together. We can do that. How we should did that. He's going to do it again. Um, if you want to talk about the battle for AI supremacy, that's the title of the super cloud. It's going to be a special edition and we are super excited. We're going to have so much editorial content. We're going to be on the ground in Vegas, reporting back to the studio team. They're going to put a stream together in studio commentary and reaction from experts in our network and our community. So it's going to be a unique first for the cube, a monster event. There'll be more content raining down from the cube than ever before. It'll be a reinvent like you've never seen. It's going to be chock full of content. Of course, our cubeai.com where it's going to be tuned up to help you figure out what the best stories are. So go to the Cube AI and check that out, little plug, but type in things like what is platform engineering or platform consolidation? Is uh, FinOps relevant? How do I do cost optimization? Things that have been said on the Cube from our experts are now indexed and with fast retrieval with our RAG system, our automation generation. It's super great right now. It's getting better and it's only in alpha. So check it out. So Dave, I wanted to clarify because I got a lot of questions are we streaming live from the show floor? No, we'll be sending content back to Palo Alto and we're paying out of our own pocket to be there because we want to get the most important stories and we'll do whatever it takes to get those stories. So quick clarification and plug for the Cube AI. Next yeah, thing John, you know, we'll be right, writing songs it. for the Cube, like the Beatles. So my breaking analysis was this week, I'm digging in deep to the, uh, the Gen AI power law that you, Rob Stretche, and I have been evolving and getting feedback on. So I'm digging into that. Um, getting into to, to retrieval augmented uh, generation, RAG models, um, really looking at some of the things that we've learned, bringing in some of the ETR data 
Um, talking about sort of on-prem and hybrid AI. So look for that for sure. I'm going to send you some notes, Dave, because I have a long set of, I've been doing a ton of research on vector databases, uh, vector and rag. So here's some stuff there. I'm going to send this to you right now. Folks, thanks for watching episode 36. Dave, any final uh, comments you want to, uh, to make before we break this down? I just, um, you know, I continue to believe that AI, I, I believe the hype that this is going to be, Gen AI is going to be super transformative. Maybe not so much, you know, in the form of chat GPT. I mean, but, but that was the catalyst that has awakened everybody's sense of the potential of this, this new generation of technology. And I think, I guess the, what I would say is the key is going to be the finding the use cases, making sure you got the right business model and then, and then showing value. Because if you do that, you're going to get money to refund and reinvest. Cause right now the, the gen AI stuff and the AI stuff is stealing from other budget items yeah. and that can't last unless you can show value and then yeah. do share gains. I'm just excited. I'll just continue to reiterate. I'm drunk on AI still every day. This has been an amazing run so far. I think it's not even just scratching the surface. I think we're going to see an explosion of innovation. If it doesn't get thrown the wet blanket of regulation on, I think we have to let this let the let the chaos reign and then reign in the chaos to quote the famous Andy Grove. So um, I think this is going to be a seismic shift like the PC revolution and the web combined, bigger than those two forces. I see a generation shift. Um, and again, front row seat, Dave, like we've had for 13 years with the queue. It's going to be a great, great run. So we'll continue to, to bang it out. And oh, by the way, it's now public, Dave, put it out there that the Wikibon is being renamed as the Cube Research and Advisory. We're going to rebrand that site and continue our legacy of providing great content. So Dave, I know you've been working hard on that. Can't wait to see the news next week when it comes out. But uh, a little preview there for the, for the folks who made it this far. All right. Thanks, All right. John. See you next time. See you guys.